studios at the time. So she she signed a contract with them. She started making little films with them. She became this big star. So by the 1920s, she started freelancing around Hollywood for studios such as Paramount. And in 1928, like at the height of her career, uh, now this is where her bad luck starts. Uh, she just really couldn't catch a break. Um, in 1928, she signed a big contract with RKO. And then before she, right before she started work on that contract, she went to... Um, she went to vacation in the Sierras, where she was bucked off a Bronco, shattered her hip, and really did not walk again for the next nine years until 1937. And so in that time, she made like little bit parts. She never really was fully able to make a comeback. So she made a bunch of different little bit parts. So in 1937, she finally got her ability to walk again. So in 1943, there was an article, I think maybe in Variety or The Hollywood Reporter, mm -hmm. that stated, Anna Q. Nelson is making a comeback. And Barbara Stanwyck's next great film, uh, I think it was called The Great Man's Lady, it, right before she started filming that, she slipped on the ice in Manhattan and cracked a vertebrae. So, <laughs> going great. <laughs> yeah. So she so she is in the film, but I don't think it was as big of a part as she originally hoped it would be. And then she did kind of make a comeback in 1947 in Loretta uh, Young's film, The Farmer's Daughter. And then shortly after that, she ran her car into the back of an insurance broker's car in kind of a car wreck. And uh, she was sued for $25,000. So she couldn't make a comeback then. Um, so Jeez, bless her heart. She just really couldn't catch a break. You no, know? no, but we need to like, I mean, it's too late now, but we need to wrap her in some like, like some cushioning <laughs> and like, she can't go skating anymore. We can't have her do anything dangerous. Good night. It's like, if you want to have your own film career, just sit in your house as still as you possibly can have somebody <laughs> drive you to the studio, shoot your scenes and then come back home and sit in the, sit in your bubble house. wrap yourself. Right. Right, but she did, I mean, she made all sorts of like little little short appearances in different films like Sunset Boulevard, mm -hmm. um, The Great Man's Lady with Barbara Stanwyck. She was in The Seven Brides for Seven Brothers, like one of the, the mothers of one of the girls that was kidnapped by mm -hmm. one of the Seven Brothers. So then, <sighs> the last waxwork sitting at that table, Buster Keaton. One of my favorites. Buster Keaton had, in 1917, had been, uh, he had been in a family of acrobats that worked in a circus and so he was a trained acrobat unfortunately his father was an alcoholic so in 1917 his father's alcohol alcoholism broke up the family buster keaton then started freelancing as kind of a filmmaker and i believe he worked at paramount for a little bit he started making his own he started freelancing making his own films and the way that buster keaton would make a film I've heard that Charlie Chaplin may have made some of his own films the same way, but he would go out, he would start, he would just start shooting. He'd jump in and start shooting. And then he'd start building, um, building the rest of the film around like that first thing. So it was all kind of avant-garde, like shoot, you know, he'd shoot one scene and be like, huh, that was interesting. How can I add to that, that story plot? So he'd build and build and build and build. Um, and in 1928, because he needed the money, he signed a very big contract with MGM. I can see you stifling a yawn, Mallory. Shut up. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm very sorry. I'm sorry. Keep going. Uh, but anyway, he signed a very big contract with MGM. Um, and many friends told him, you will not like working for Louis B. Mayer or Irving Thalberg because they are... MGM was a dream factory. It was a factory of motion pictures. Before they went into each film, they wouldn't just shoot a scene and then build on that. They had to have like the budget, they had to have the script, they had to have the actors hire, the costumes, the scenery, which that's not how Buster Keaton worked at all. So there were many professional and creative differences between Buster Keaton and Louis B. Mayer. And so by 1933, he made his last feature film with MGM before he walked out on his contract. Well, then his own alcoholism overtook him. His wife, uh, left him. I think he almost had to foreclose on like his giant mansion. So he had to crawl back on his hands and knees to Louis B. Mayer and beg for his contract back. And Louis B. Mayer said, okay, you can be, you can come back, but no more feature films for you. And you can only be in educational films and you will be um, our resident comedy coach for all of the stars that we bring in, you know, right. you know, so like, people like Red Skelton and Lucille Ball, when they came to MGM, they worked with Buster Keaton. So he had kind of had a sad past also until 1949. He played a role in the Judy Garland musical in the good old summertime. Right. That I, 
that wasn't his last film appearance, but that was his like first big feature film appearance in a very long time because the, he had co-written a character that only he could play. So mm -hmm. the director was just like, you go play this character. So he got to be in that, in that. So that's the history of Buster Keaton. Lo and behold, we haven't finished the history of Sunset Boulevard yet. So we're going to keep yep. talking. Let's do it. So uh, John F. Seitz worked as cinematographer on Sunset Boulevard. And Seitz rose to prominence. Now, this is interesting because even the cinematographer was close to the silent age. He rose to prominence with Rudolph Valentino when he worked as cinematographer on Valentino's first film, Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, in 1921. Mm -hmm. Now, Gloria Swanson and Rudolph Valentino had made a film together in the 20s called Beyond the Rocks, where John F. Seitz was a cinematographer. And Gloria Swanson and Rudolph Valentino, funny enough, did a tango in that movie. So it has been speculated that John F. Seitz had something to do with the line, Gloria, well, Gloria Swanson and John F. Seitz had something to do with the line, Rudolph Valentino said there's nothing like tile for a tango because they had both, they had both oh, tangled yeah. with Rudolph Valentino. And just funny little fact, Seitz could not stand to watch actors act. So when Wilder called, rolled them after Seitz had like lit, um, lit the set and, you know, set the cameras, he would stand in a corner with his face to the wall because he did not like to watch actors act. That's fair. I don't like to watch myself act. I know. <laughs> I see things and I'm like, nope, get it out. Every time I start acting, I go stand in a corner, my face <laughs> to the wall. <laughs> That's what you do when you act. I remember acting with you. It's like that. Yeah, exactly. All the time. And, um, oh, and this is also very interesting. So Seitz, as cinematographer, he would take to make like Norma Desmond's house feel murky. Beforehand, he would like take hands of dust and whew, blow it all over the set. And Billy Wyler said that John F. Seitz, when they worked together on Double Indemnity in 1944 with Barbara Stanwyck, Barbara Stanwyck's house in that was is kind of a dark, creepy house. So that's when John F. Seitz blew dust everywhere. So Seitz also did that for Norma Desmond's house. Now, costumes by Edith Head. Oh, so I just costumes. <laughs> I know, I, I know, gorgeous costumes. Just a partial list of all of the materials they made: chiffon, velvet, chinchilla, tulle, brocade, taffeta, ermine, and le leopard printed crepe. Um, can you imagine? Well, no, no. I don't I mean, want to work with that. <laughs> no, I don't want to work with any of that stuff. I'm well, sure leopard like... print specifically, I'm like, ooh, like it's like <laughs> I, I'm aware it looks. It's a very cool, chic look back in the day, but now I'm just like, no. I know it. No, it's just tacky. It's loud and tacky. Yeah, it's it's opinion. funny how that changes over time. It used to be like the symbol, of like her, like everybody being very luxurious, with like your animal print, and now it's like tacky. Right. It was a sign of stat status. Yes. And it's like a throwback to Polinegri's pet leopard. Also, because yes. it, it's used, it lines Gloria Swanson's car, mm -hmm. the Azata Fraschini. Um, she has it in turban. She has it in, I feel like there's either, even like it's, a hostess. It's like trimmed. Yeah. Yes. It's all, she has it in, like, on a lot of stuff. Yes. Yeah, I feel like I need to make a list of everything that's lined. I, I'll tell you what, we'll stop, I'll watch the movie, and then I'll come back. Uh, real quick. It'll, it'll just take yeah. a couple hours. It's fine. Just real quick. We'll be here all day. Yeah, um, it'll be fine. But The audience won't know that, but we'll be here all day. <laughs> exactly. But it's used really as a symbol by Edith Head as Norma is a predatory character. She's oh, yeah. playing on Joe Gillis, you know. Even if she doesn't realize it, because I, I firmly, I mean, not to get too far into, like, the meaning portion, but, like, I fully believe she doesn't necessarily understand that what she's doing is is bad, but she's, like, set her sights on him, like, right right from the get-go. He believes that he, he got her, but in reality, it's the other way around. Well, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, because he believes it's a financial, good financial thing for himself, but he's the young, beautiful prince trapped in the Wicked Witch's castle. Yep. Um, she's the praying leopard on the beautiful young gazelle, even though if the gazelle is beautiful, young, and somewhat cynical. Um, <laughs> Very cynical. I know, I know. But the interesting thing about Edith Head was that she started work at Paramount in 1923 at 26 years old as a sketch artist. And at the time she started working at Paramount, Gloria Swanson was Paramount's biggest star. So she said it was, it, it really was a big thing for her to work with Gloria Swanson on uh, Sunset Boulevard at Paramount. 
because she had been like the biggest when Edith Head was still walking around the studio with stars in her eyes. So Edith Head, during the 1920s, when Gloria Swanson was a big star, would wash out Gloria Swanson's hosiery every day. Um, so she had a history with Gloria. Mm-hmm. She had washed she out. She knew her, her intimately. <laughs> yes, yes. Edith Head never remembered them meeting at Paramount in the 1920s, but Gloria Swanson requested that they work together um, and was very hands-on in helping Edith Head. So anyway, uh, I just have written down Hans Dreyer and John Meehan were production designers on Sunset Boulevard. Hans Dreyer, Billy Wilder, and Franz Boxman had all been employees of UFA, uh, the German film studio in um, Berlin um in the 1920s Hans Dreyer I believe was German and he was coached coaxed in the 1920s by director Ernst Lubitsch to come work on films in America uh Franz Voxman left because he was almost beat to death by Nazis in the street in the 1930s so Franz Voxman brilliant composer who wrote like the score of course for Sunset Boulevard if you have not listened to the score go to Spotify and listen to it right now you will not be sorry you might be a little bit depressed after you listen to it but it's still great Um, put on something else afterwards it's fine Uh, but he also like he won the Oscar for Sunset Boulevard Franz Waxman and he also won the Oscar for A Place in the Sun the following year he wrote the score for Hitchcock's Rear Window, he wrote the score for Bride of Frankenstein in 1935. So he had he had quite the portfolio behind him. Mm-hmm. So, like I said, Dreyer, Voxman, and Wilder all worked at, U- at UFA, uh, UFA, and immigrated to the U.S. because of Nazis, except for Dreyer, who I believe was German. Now, if somebody wants to write in and be like, you liar, that's not right, feel free to do so. Just be kind. <laughs> So now we have to get to release of Sunset Boulevard. Are you ready for this? I'm ready. Let's do it. So Sunset Boulevard, they shot the film from April to June of 1949. And then in late 1949, they previewed it for audiences in Illinois, Poughkeepsie, New York, and Great Neck, Long Island. And what happened, and it started in Illinois, was the opening sequence, the original opening sequence of Sunset Boulevard caused the audience to laugh hysterically. They could not stop laughing. And have you heard this story before? I have heard the the story. Yes, what the original sequence was. The original sequence after the very, the fiery opening sequence underscored by Franz Waxman, the camera pans up to an ambulance and the ambulance goes to a morgue. And in the morgue, we find William Holden's body and dead William Holden starts talking to all of the corpse around, corpses around him. So it's all in flashback, William Holden, the dead body. It's his flashback of events to happen. And they thought that was so funny, all of these different talking corpses. And Billy Wilder um, said that the audience started laughing hysterically in, in Illinois. And so he went and he sat down on some stairs on the way down to the toilet and a woman passed him laughing hysterically. And she said, have you ever seen shit like this? And he said, never in my life. So that happened in those three different cities. So then Paramount pushed Billy Wilder to recut and reshoot Sunset Boulevard. So it wasn't so funny. And there was also speculation that it was going to be shelved which it wasn't because Billy, because that's when they reshot the opening sequence. And that's when you find William Holden floating in the pool, which was done with, I read a thing that the water in order for the water not to get cloudy, it had to be 40 degrees Fahrenheit or lower. So Bill Holden was super chilly in that water, but he was floating. And then they put a mirror at the bottom of the pool. So what you see is the camera is on the side of the pool, shooting down into the pool, capturing the image that's on the mirror of William Holden floating in the water Mm -hmm. that was the new uh, opening sequence which audiences i believe in midsummer 1950 before the film was released in um, august of 1950 august 10th of 1950 audiences uh reply or responded better to that opening sequence than they did of the talking corpses i totally would have laughed at the talking corpses and i would have thought that was the funniest (laughs) thing in the world can you imagine like a bunch of they should make a disney movie it's where the corpses sing and dance and talk to one another can you imagine that no i can never imagine that it's honestly corpse bride kind of approaches that that tone but what happened is by january of 1950 because the film had been pushed back it was originally, I think, 
supposed to be released in early, late 49, early 1950, so they could make the Oscars in 1950, which it didn't, it wasn't nominated until the Oscars.